I'm going to kick off today. I, we were, I have about five minutes to recap yesterday and kind of line out today. My name is Amy Waltz. I am the Director of Science Delivery and Outreach at the Ecological Restoration Institute in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, yesterday, I listened to our keynotes, as you guys did. I listened to um, our case studies, the panel. I even got to walk around and visit some of the breakout rooms. And I found the statement so rich. So how can I summarize yesterday in a, in a, in a minute or two? But my takeaways, and if you guys could show that first slide, thank you. My takeaways included building community. Susan and John set the stage for place-based storytelling. So the whole day I heard stories. It was all about storytelling, sharing personal, cultural, and ecological stories. My takeaways, in, in addition to building community, is to ask the questions, to do the work. But I really liked Emily's forgive ourselves for the load of work that is still to be done. I heard that our landscapes altered by novel disturbances need eco cultural restoration. We heard of the need to reconnect our tribal youth to post wildfire ancestral lands through some innovative ways to re make those connections real. We were able to share the hard things and realize that it's hard everywhere. Along with Susan, who shared this in the plenary, I also heard a lot of stubborn optimism yesterday. So I made this little from my notes of what I heard yesterday. I'm sure we all heard other things and I'm looking forward to our outcomes document. Today, we're gonna to continue our storytelling about our climate altered West and how that informs our post disturbance recovery, reforestation items and sustainability. Climate change and adaptation are mostly informed by math heavy models, global teams of scientists with huge acronyms on their names Today, we get a chance to talk about your place-based observations of drought, tree mortality, changes in your systems. I'm hopeful we'll hear, we have a, a great panel today and I'm hopeful we'll hear insights on how are we talking about climate adaptation and mitigation? What are the issues that we face to maintain forests through different reforestation tactics? What are examples of some of the tools we can use in our place-based work? I wanted to share too that our format has to change a little bit. I don't think I don't think this is related to climate change, but Chris Swanson, who really wanted to be here, is snowed in in Michigan, and flights were canceled. But he's with us virtually, so he'll give a um, a message that might be a little shorter. And I, I think Chris is with us right now. Um, and then we're going to switch to something we call lightning talks. They should be about seven to nine minutes. I'll share that science delivery spe specialists love lightning talks, like get straight to the message. Our speakers, not so much. <laughs> so it's always a balance. Um, finally, I think, I think when the lightning talks are done, I'm gonna have, everybody's just gonna sit on stage after they give their talks and we'll have some minutes for a question and answer. Then we'll go into a break and then we'll have a breakout group. You guys did so well yesterday. This morning's breakout is just like yesterday. We're gonna split into the rooms. There'll actually be two breakouts in this room again, one in the poster room and then that suite of breakouts down the hallway. And you're gonna be working on the same things. I'll review this again after the Q&A. It's after a break, so you, know, you should welcome our conference organizers shooing you down the halls. And then um, after that will be lunch. And this afternoon, we're super excited to welcome the state foresters from Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona for a panel discussion. We're then gonna switch a little bit more to focus on planning and implementation in our novel ecosystems. And we'll share a case study from our Wood for Life partners. And then this afternoon breakouts, I think a lot of people are excited about because these are the ones that are topic based and they're in your agenda with assigned room numbers. So in that case, you're gonna go to the topic you're interested in. That's my quick overview. And now I'll kick off our session. And with, um, I would love to introduce Dr. Chris Swanston. 
And Chris is the director of the USDA Office of Sustainability and Climate and climate advisor to the Forest Service. He helps lead the USDA climate hubs in the development of vulnerability assessments, adaptation strategies, and additional tools that translate adaptation into um, planning documents in support of natural resources, management, and decision making. So without further ado, I'll, I'll welcome Chris. Hi, Chris, take it away. Hi, Amy. Thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation uh, from you and Brett. Uh, hi, everybody. I am so sorry that I couldn't be there. Uh, there are certain drawbacks uh, to living in a small town, uh, one of those being a, a small airport with just a couple flights a day. Um, and if those get canceled, everything uh, backs up. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for being able to put up with me in video, especially uh, in an in-person uh, conference, which um, I haven't seen many of those in the last few years, like most of you, and uh, really looked forward to it. Um, I will just do a quick check. Hopefully everybody can hear me and see my slide. Yeah. I heard it, yeah. Great, okay. Uh, so. I was looking at the wonderful lineup you have, uh, and I was going to do kind of a, a tactical presentation about adaptation stuff, um, and ultimately decided, you know, I, I just wasn't really adding any value uh, to the lineup of speakers that you have. So I decided uh, with Amy and Brett's, um, you know, agreement that I would step back a little bit and talk about really some of the things that I struggle with on a daily basis uh, and that we as a community, I think, as well struggle with. Uh, so this is really a, a discussion about hard truth, denial, uh, and hope. Uh, I don't have the answers for you. Uh, what I do have is uh, maybe just uh, a willingness to discuss some of my own struggles with some of these issues, some of my own frustrations, um, and put that out there. Uh, I wish that I could have been there uh, to have folks come up afterwards and disagree with me, um, uh, engage me in discussion, um, teach me. Uh, but hopefully, uh, you will do all those things uh, with each other. Okay, technology. There we go. Uh, first of all, let's talk about some hard truths. Uh, these six climate related vulnerabilities uh, are at the basis of the climate adaptation plan for the Forest Service. And um, you'll see there on the left, the biophysical vulnerabilities. Um, the first is shifting fire regimes. Uh, I know that you are all aware of these and you heard about this a lot yesterday. Um, this gets its own vulnerability because it is so complex, interwoven as it is with fire exclusion, with climate-driven uh, uh, um, uh, vapor pressure deficit, dryness, aridity, uh, so changes in fuels, um, ecosystem, long-term ecosystem changes, both related to the fire exclusion, also to climate change, um, all resulting, you know, uh, also um, wildland urban interface, all resulting in these uh, shifting fire regimes. Um, there is a hope that our massive investment in uh, addressing the wildfire crisis through fuels reduction and restoration will solve this crisis um, of shifting fire regimes, but um, it won't. Uh, we're gonna continue to see this uh, as a reality. So perhaps uh, we won't necessarily in 15 years be talking about a wildfire crisis, at that point, maybe we will have gotten past some of the most extreme dangers in uh, populated areas. But even so, we're still going to be sh uh, dealing with shifting fire regimes. And um, the crisis may be uh, some of the same realities that we're dealing with today, uh, but we won't be calling it a crisis because hopefully uh, we'll have learned to live with it a little better uh, than we are now and talk about it a little bit more openly than we do or have been uh, in the past. Uh, so there are other extreme events and disturbances that we see all the time in Colorado and all through your part of the country. Uh, you see, you have been seeing these um, in overwhelming uh, uh, expanses and severities. Um, these, again, feed right back into the shifting fire regimes, but they aren't necessarily gonna stop either. Uh, one thing, 
uh, is that uh, when we have, um, you know, what's called, of course, climate change is directly driven by a global warming. Uh, as we see these increases in temperature, one of the things that we see uh, is um, with every couple degrees in temperature, the air can hold of increase, the air can hold another 7% of moisture. And you end up uh, then when you get big hits uh, for short amounts of time, you can then have that followed by extreme rain, which causes flooding and erosion. But likewise, uh, before it rains, you get that moisture that's in the air being pulled out of everything that's all around, um, all around us in the ecosystems. And so that increases um, fuel aridity, uh, but it also can kill trees straight outright. Uh, so we get top kill, we get stress, um, we get more susceptibility to insect and pests. All of this is causing change. Uh, sometimes it causes uh, large swaths of mortality. Um, but then it also causes over time just chronic stress. And um, sometimes that chronic stress is really not appreciated uh, for what it is. If you look at uh, habitat distribution models or species distribution models, a, a lot of the time you'll see these, these shifts in habitat uh, that are projected with climate change. It doesn't mean that the, the species themselves, uh, their vegetation are just gonna die uh, right now. Uh, but what it does mean is that when the habitat shifts and the species are left behind, uh, they're going to be faced with tougher times. Um, they're outside of their ideal uh, habitat. And so they're not going to rebound as much from disturbance and they're going to be more susceptible to competition. Thus, you get this idea of chronic stress. Um, so this is the reality, a set of hard truths about uh, the world that we live in and the world that all of you as natural resources professionals are committed to working with uh, and to serving really. Uh, on the right, you have um, a whole other set of realities which are less biophysical uh, and more about um, our commitment to serving people, um, to serving the nation's needs, um, our community's needs, um, and um, as well as uh, you know, upholding the things that we've built. Um, all of those are also facing a significant disruption. And as they uh, are disrupted and harmed, that again has feedback into society's willingness to invest uh, into the disturbances that we're seeing in the forests, um, often which are out of sight and out of mind to people. So that is another threat that is often unstated and um, unseen. I'm, I, I promise not to go for my full 30 minutes. So I'm just gonna move on. I think that in this group, you guys get uh, a lot of these hard truths. Um, I think that we also understand um, that a lot of the public doesn't uh, get a lot of these hard truths. So let's talk a little bit about denial. On the left, uh, you have this climate change denial. Um, you know, we're used to that. We've been seeing that for years. And frankly, uh, it's shrinking all the time. Uh, there are fewer and fewer pe people who deny that climate change is happening. Um, more people who still deny that we are causing it, but that group is shrinking also. Um, and especially the folks who deny that climate change is happening, they're just taken less seriously uh, all the time. But where we have climate risk denial, now my opinion is that this is still pervasive. Uh, and romantic, that might look like a, an odd word uh, to a lot of people. So let me just explain that a little bit. Um, what I experience a lot, pretty much on a daily basis in my job, is that people are just unwilling, uh, sometimes unable, to accept the realities of the impacts of climate change on the places, especially the places that they love. Um, they may, you know, they are not denying climate, they're not denying the effects of climate broadly, but in terms of the places they love, they just can't take that final step and, and deal with some of those cold, hard truths. Uh, this is also true sometimes of ideas and processes, business as usual. They're just not willing to uh, face the realities of um, the effects of climate change on those things that they are dedicated to, that they love, that they are loyal to. Uh, so this doesn't seem um, nefarious to me, right? This seems, you know, more like just they're being romantic about 
the um, persistence of these things that they love uh, when in fact those things are, in, are, are at great risk. We see this especially with some issues like old growth. Um, a lot of the time, people want us to draw this line around a map uh, around old growth or mature forests. And they think that because the system is old growth and has persisted for hundreds or thousands of years, it's gonna somehow be not susceptible to climate change. Uh, and that if we stay out of it altogether, um, that it'll be even uh, more resistant or resilient to climate change. Uh, that is not consistent with my understanding of the science behind both climate change and forest ecology. Uh, I feel like it is a romantic view of those systems and I empathize with that. I feel it, I get it. Um, but it also is, I'm just gonna call it out, it's maladaptive for many of these systems uh, the things that they care about will probably be lost if we're not going to intervene in some way to maintain them. Uh, so thus that romantic view of denial. In terms of ideas, you know, I talked about shifting fire regimes a minute ago. So, you know, I had an interaction, my team had an interaction uh, not long ago with somebody within the Forest Service uh, who said very distinctly, we should have never said fire regimes shift. Fire regimes don't change because they're based on a historical range of variation and history doesn't change. Uh, likewise, um, to the extent that fire exclusion may have changed ecology of systems and that climate is changing, it's our role as the Forest Service to restore those systems so that they are resilient to climate. So it's hard to know where to start uh, with that view. And, and I get it, again, that sense of adherence, loyalty to some ideas and an inability or unwillingness to change. Uh, so let's talk about comfort words. Restoration and resilience are two of our strongest comfort words. I use them, heck, they're in the authorities of my agency. Uh, and yet they are often used, I think, to comfort folks instead of help people address hard realities, internally and externally. So let's, let me just ask a few questions. Uh, we can't answer these necessarily uh, right now, and this is a case-by-case -case sort of thing, but I just want to throw these ideas out there. So first of all, uh, when we're talking about restoration of a specific system, is there an adaptation sweet spot for that system? Which is to say, you know, could be um, there's a maple system now and you're going to replace it, transition it to uh, oak savanna. And that system, oak savanna, will be better adapted to a range of future climates than what's there now. So that's a sweet spot for adaptation and restoration. That is uh, an absolute win. Uh, but what if, um, well, assuming that that place in the you know previous times was uh, dominated by oak. So what if the reference condition though is no longer viable but we're going to go ahead and restore it anyway because that's what we do again uh, that is something that i would call maladaptive that is something that we should be talking about maybe we're mandated to do that and that's just the reality we should at least be talking about the risk that we're incurring as we pursue that path uh, sometimes i hear about people talking about restoration of species or structure that was never there previously but we're restoring function so that it will be better adapted to a future climate. Um, so I'm not really sure what that means. And I would say that, and I, and I know I'm stepping into an enormous restoration you know, debate here, just gonna do it though. I don't know if that passes the mom test. You know, I, I, I think about how I would explain things to my mom. And if I tried to say, yeah, I'm gonna restore you know, this old house, um, but it's not gonna be a Victorian anymore. It's gonna be, you know, postmodern. I don't actually know what that means, just saying that. And, you know, my mom would say, well, sweetie, that's not really restoration. Uh, that sounds like a remodel, but okay. And by the way, have you called your sister recently? You know, so, you know, thinking through that, uh, how, how truthful, how clear are we being with that messaging? Uh, so likewise, there's this idea of a future range of variability, which I got to a moment ago with uh, think about a range of future climates. Same thing. What if that reference condition? So what if the future range of climates just doesn't overlap much 
with a, a natural range of variability, a historic range of variability, you know, we have more risk at that point. Are we really communicating those risks? Does the public really understand those risks? Are they uh, in a denial, um, you know, romantic denial? Um, and are we allowing that? Are we in that denial as well? Uh, man, I could go on forever, but you get the point. Um, sometimes I try to prompt some of these questions and discussions by identifying climate giving a climate modifier before restoration. I actually really dislike the term climate smart, uh, in part because I feel like it creates a sense of um, more certainty or more um, uh, 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 less danger, less, uh, um, it's just a bit smarmy. Uh, instead, a lot of the time I use climate informed. Um, you know, climate informed uh, really is a, uh, a term that gives you a lot of leeway. It acknowledges that you may not be making the most ideal choice, the most climate smart choice, the choice that has the most carbon accrual or somehow adapts the system um, in the best possible way. But instead you're making the choice you're able to make given the constraints you have as a, a, an NGO or a public agency. Um, it also prompts people to ask what that means, which is always a good conversation to have. And then resilience. Um, I use resilience all the time. Uh, there's a paper by Susie Mosier uh, and uh, some of her colleagues that really helped me understand how people talk about resilience. Uh, there's some folks who talk about resilience and they're thinking about the traits of an existing system, the resilience of those traits that they want to maintain. Um, could be other components. They just want to maintain that system. There are folks who are looking at a system and they're not seeing the system as it is. Uh, they're just seeing at the system for how it could be or for what it gives them. Uh, and so in the first case, you know, you're grounded in traits um, in the existing system. In the second case, in outcomes of potentially a future system. Um, in terms of that, uh, uh, the outcomes, they could be timber, you know, services. They could be just what they could be covering the soil with trees uh, for less erosion. So, you know, watershed values, for example. Now, using this term scale matters, if I'm talking about the whole national forest system, I'm going to use resilience pretty broadly, and that's fine because it's a you know big country. If I'm talking about a stand or a set of stands within a project area, I'm going to be as explicit as I can because what I say really matters to that system. If I say resilience, I'm talking about persistence of that of traits in that existing system. If I'm not, if I'm talking about a future desired condition, and I think that system is vulnerable, I'm going to say I need to transition that system to something different so that it can be resilient uh, across a range of future climates. But the current system is not resilient. I'm going to try to be clear. Um, and as I'm being clear, I always am going to be checking myself about doublespeak. And doublespeak isn't exactly some nefarious, evil government thing. It's something we all do as we're trying to avoid difficult conversations and not hurt people uh, hurt their feelings when they are uh, really um, uh, when they you know really care about a system that they're probably going to lose. So always be asking these questions: Are we in denial ourselves? Are we supporting others in their denial, enabling uh, their denial? So in terms of hope, uh, as I was in the airport on Monday morning, watching my choices diminish, sitting with a friend, um, thinking about. You know, hope as one does uh, in that sort of situation, uh, you know, in a winter storm in May. Uh, he was, a, he's a professor, was explaining to me um, the ontology of hope. I can't remember most of the words he used, but he described a couple of major approaches to hope that people have in, inherently. Some people are inspired by outcomes. They have this reasonable expectation of outcomes, certain outcomes, and that is hope for them. Um, they're susceptible to being disappointed and losing hope if they don't get these outcomes or don't see them coming. There are others who are driven by duty. Uh, they have a reasonable expectation of certain outcomes because they're helping to create those outcomes. Uh, they're somewhat less susceptible to losing hope because they are creating those outcomes and because they are driven by duty, even if they don't see those outcomes uh, arising like they would like them to. Nobody is entirely necessarily one uh, or the other. And a lot of the time, these two things really support one another. 
if I think about outcomes and hope, I just look over the last couple of years and I see these major documents in my own agency coming out of the Forest Service. I see the, the wildfire crisis strategy. Uh, now, there are people who think that it's maybe not the best strategy or it could be bigger or it shouldn't have been as big, but just look at what it does. It is bold and it calls out climate explicitly as one of the causes of the wildfire crisis we're in. I don't see this document as having come out 10 years ago, even though people were talking about it 10 years ago. The first climate talk I ever saw as a grad student was 30 years ago and described exactly what we're experiencing now as something that would happen in 30 years. The Climate Adaptation Plan, which we published last year. This is an 85-page document that calls out clearly our vulnerabilities and the struggles we're having with adapting to them. Uh, I don't see this document as having been publishable five or 10 years ago. And yet it got through with virtually no resistance. The Climate Action Tracker, some of you may have heard of the performance, the climate performance scorecard the Forest Service has done in the past. 12 years ago, that was a major, major effort. 10 questions, yes, no, just for the National Forest System. It was paradigm shifting, um, uh, a huge lift, very controversial. This climate action tracker is fully quantitative. It has more than 120 questions. There are more than 149 parts of the entire Forest Service that respond to this action tracker, quantitative. And in our first publication of this report, we did get a bit of pushback of, hey, my group doesn't show up as well as I would like it to. I would like you, know, you to back off on some of this language. And when I declined, I had the full support of our leadership in doing so, because this is about showing progress and finding areas where we need more progress. That gives me hope. These are outcomes. Likewise, in the last 10 years, the majority of more than 50 vulnerability assessments covering most of the national forests have been created. If you look at NIAX's work with the adaptation workbook, they have more than 600 projects, explicit adaptation projects that have gone through this structured process that they map mostly in this uh, area of the Northeast, Upper Midwest, but around the country, we are now building that workbook process into our national NEPA approach. And then you have the Wildlife Conservation Society and their Climate Adaptation Fund. The Forest Service and many state agencies and other organizations have been involved in this. Another 150 adaptation projects, explicit and clear across the country right there. And so you look at these, you know, coming up on a thousand explicit structured adaptation projects on the ground uh, around the country. Um, so you think about the space that we're dealing with, you know, that might not seem like a lot, but to me, what it seems like is that summer storm where you're outside and you feel those first drops of rain on your skin. And then it's, it's a, a, a few more drops. And then before you know it uh, a lot, and then it's a downpour. That's how I see this right now. We're heading to that downpour. So these are outcomes and they might not turn out the way you want, but what really gives me hope is based on duty. And that's where I tend to focus. You people are my hope. You're here, well, there, I wish I was with you. You're here now having these discussions. You're doing this hard work. You're asking these questions. You go to work on a daily basis and try to get these done. You create the pathways for hope. You create the pathways to get this work done to give other people hope when they're outcomes oriented. You are creating the outcomes. To me, you all mission oriented people, uh, you create hope for me. And I think that you should also create hope for each other. And that gets back to that community that I heard just a moment ago from Amy, uh, that stubborn optimism. Make your hope, do it for each other. So concluding thoughts, oh my God, I, I went way longer than I thought. I tried, I really did. So truths are difficult, but you have a community. You're not alone. We can deal with this. We know that our climate informed choices, they're just not gonna always be what we want them to be. We need to be clear about that with the public um, because they're going to get only harder over time. Finally, we want to be intentional and explicit about our climate planning all the time. Uh, the less explicit we are, 
um, the more likely we are to shift into that gentle doublespeak of trying to help people avoid a sense of loss and harm. They need to cope with this just like we do. In a sense, that really means that we need to embrace discomfort. As an introvert, I am uncomfortable every single day in this work. If we're completely comfortable in doing this work, we're probably not doing the best we can do in our jobs because there is nothing comfortable about climate change and the choices that it gives us. What we do have, again, is each other and that sense of agency uh, that we create through our work in creating the best possible outcomes that we can for the systems that we love. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was great. I think that was a great charge. We're going to switch into our lightning talks now. And our first one is Marin Chambers from the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. Where'd you go, Marin? There she is. And for my speakers, I forgot to go over this, but I'm going to um, give you little hand signals from the audience. So when, come on up, Marin. <laughs> So when you reach um, six minutes, I'll let you know you have three more minutes, and then I'll let you know you have two more minutes, and then I'll let you know you've won, and then I'll pull you off. <laughs> okay. At like 10, oh, 11. I'll give you Okay. And then do I sit up here after? And then, if, yeah, if you would join Okay. Us Sounds great. Um, good morning, and how amazing and what an honor to follow Chris Swanston, and what an amazing and inspiring talk. Um, so I want to thank the workshop organizers for the invitation to speak with you today and for all of the amazing efforts that you've put in to create such an incredible workshop for us all to be thinking about the opportunities and challenges that we're facing collectively in our work. So um, I want to talk with you all today about the reforestation pipeline and some of the challenges and opportunities that I see occurring um, in a changing climate. So I'm going to try to figure this out. All right. So I think Chris did an amazing job of um, kind of illustrating for us the major challenges that we're facing in terms of climate change and also some of the ecosystem services and disasters that we might be experiencing. So I'm not gonna spend time because I have, as Amy mentioned, about nine minutes and I'll probably go over. Um, uh, but I wanted to quickly you know, kind of give you a sense of what's happening with reforestation given a changing climate and changing disturbance regimes. But I'm not going to talk about all of the things, so I'm just going to jump right into reforestation needs. And I think that one of the things that's going on, aside from the fact that we have increasing temperature um, and drought and, of course, changing disturbance patterns, um, increasing uh, size, severity, and frequency of wildfires, we're also seeing that following these kinds of disturbances and these changes in climate, that we're having um, changes in natural forest recovery. And there's an increasingly um, large body of evidence that's illustrating this um, across the Western US and across the world. And this is particularly so in high severity burn areas um, and given um, places where we're seeing more dramatic changes in um, climate change. Oh, excuse me, just one moment. Okay, oh. Tricky little thing. <laughs> so I think given these, this conundrum that we're experiencing of changing temperature, drought, disturbance regimes, and the fact that we're not seeing quite as much um, of the natural forest regeneration that we would hope for, we're also experiencing challenges with reforestation. And I want to point out this awesome figure um, that Cass Demrose and others led um, in 2019. And I'm going to try to do this on both sides, but I don't know if I can get all that way over there. So um, in the light gray, you can see the total reforestation need. And then in the, the darker gray is the wildfire caused reforestation need. And so then this black line is illustrating actually the actual acres that have been reforested nationally. So I think that while we're experiencing this dramatic change in temperature, drought, um, wildfire regimes, and we have this increased need for reforestation, we're actually seeing a decline in reforestation. So this is a major challenge, and I feel a little schooled by Chris because I used 
the term climate smart reforestation because it's so common. And if I could, I would cross that out and use climate informed reforestation instead. And I think we really are at a critical junction where we really need to be focusing on that. So a lot of um, people have been advocating for this. They've been seeing this problem really starting to build over time. And um, so nationally, we have some amazing funding and policy mechanisms that have really started to come into place in the last year, year and a half, particularly the Replant Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and a couple of executive orders that are really putting a lot of resources into reforestation. And I think we'll really start to see some of those changes happen in the coming years. But given the fact that we have this massive reforestation need um, for multiple reasons, and then now this huge influx of resources and policies that are changing reforestation as we've known it over the last 30 years, I wanna talk about three key things that I think are critical um, as we're moving forward into our new reforestation future. The first, ooh, tricky, tricky thing, um, excuse me. The first is logistics. Um, the second is collaborative and strategic planning. And the third is science and actionable learning. So logistics could literally probably and probably will take multiple week-long workshops in the coming years um, to really dig into. And the, the challenges around the logistics are so many that I can't even begin to start here. Um, there's been some great work by Fargioni and others, um, and this is a fabulous paper that really outlines some of the challenges around reforestation. If you're really interested, I highly recommend it. But Fargioni and, um, and others um, set out to define the reforestation pipeline as seed, nursery, um, capacity, outplanting, and post-planting challenges. Um, and there's some common threads that are woven between all of these. And particularly, I want to go back, if I am risky enough to do this with this little thing, um, is that you can actually see, we used to do a lot of reforestation in the 70s, 80s, and then sort of in the 90s, it started to drop off pretty, pretty dramatically. And so what's happened is that as a result of that is a lot of the expertise and skill that had been gained in our workforce, those folks are starting to, to retire or they already have. And so we really have sort of a dearth of expertise and skill that can be passed down. And so training is a major challenge across every single one of the pieces of this pipeline. And that, so that includes some of that capacity piece of the knowledge and expertise that we have, but also, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? It's time, it's really time that people don't have to be thinking about doing reforestation when they have so many other things on their plate. Additionally to the capacity constraints, um, resources and infrastructure are a really critical challenge that is a part of every single one of these pieces of the reforestation pipeline. And I think one of the ones that's really fascinating to point out is that um, we are running out of seed, essentially, and we do not have the seed stock to support the kind of reforestation needs that I just demonstrated um, on that, in that figure, um, but also for the kind of call to action around reforestation that's being currently called by the, Refor the Replant Act and other acts. So some of the things that um, are being done on the ground right now to try to um, address some of these here locally are that myself and some colleagues from um, TNC, American Forest, New Mexican Highlands University, New Mexico State University, put on a workshop recently to really try to drill down into what these barriers and limitations are around seed collection in, um, in the Southwest. Additionally, we are incredibly fortunate here in the Southwest region, but particularly in Northern Colorado, because in addition to our federal nurseries that can provide seedlings for post-fire reforestation or reforestation in general, we also have two um, nurseries here in Northern Colorado um, that are really amazing and are, are addressing some of these capacity constraints around seedling production. And then my colleague, Catherine Schlegel, is leading myself and others to create what we're currently calling the Google Maps of reforestation. And this is a spatial tool that we're utilizing in order to um, address um, challenges and resource limitations and information um, for uh, resource, resources for reforestation. Um, 
In terms of collaborative and strategic planning, one of the tensions that I see a lot is this desire that we all have to get out and get things done. But I think that we also, when we do that, um, which is, it's critical, we need to do that. But when we do that, sometimes we don't stop and really think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so I really want to make a plug and I humbly add on to the Fargioni et al.'s reforestation pipeline that before we do anything, even collecting seed, at least some element of the team of people, all of the people that are putting their efforts towards this need to think about strategically what are we doing at multiple scales, locally, regionally, nationally. And so um, I think that there's just an amazing amount of opportunities um, to think about how we might approach our strategic planning around this better. The first and most obvious one is collaborative partnerships. Um, but I think there's some other ones, including um, better integration of pre, during, and post-fire management planning and actions. And so a great example of this might be um, that in high severity burn areas, often there's fire refugia or surviving seed sources that are left over um, that provide seed for um, natural forest recovery. And this could become a pre-fire um, fuels management challenge in that we can think about, this is a novel idea, not something that we're currently doing, but I see a lot of potential opportunities to integrate some of the activities that we're already doing to protect resources like this by possibly going and actually clearing out some of those fuels and even possibly prescribed burning some of these areas. Lots of opportunities like that. Additionally, I think there's um, a lot of opportunity to incorporate the pre and during fire decision making and prioritization frameworks that we already have in existence and are well utilized to really be thinking about reforestation and post fire management in general. And so this includes some of the data that we're already utilizing for, for example, um, potential operational delineation systems, watershed risk analyses, infrastructure values at risk, on the ground knowledge, et cetera. And I think my colleague, Ali Ray, is going to be talking about this later this afternoon um, in a post-fire session. Um, I think also critically, we need to be better incorporating climate adaptation frameworks into strategic planning and also science and adaptive management. OK, I have one minute, um, so I'm going to try this cover as this as quick as I can. So I think um, in terms of science and actionable learning, I just want to humbly um, promote the, that we're integrating as much as possible best available science into every single component of the reforestation pipeline. I think we're already doing that, but we can certainly enhance that. There are so many critical questions to be addressed around um, reforestation, particularly natural forest recovery in a changing climate and under changing disturbances, particularly compound disturbances. And this depends on forest type. Um, but I think that those, those questions around natural forest recovery bear to make us ask, so then when, what, how, and why should we be planting? And that starts to bring up a lot of questions and controversy around assisted migration. So there's some really big things that we need to tackle and really start to get more information so that we have a better understanding of what we're looking at into the future. So I think some of the opportunities that we have that I just want to really quickly um, uh, I address are that um, the US Forest Service has created a assisted migration technical assistance team to help address some of these questions and controversies around assisted migration. In the Southwest, we really lack common garden studies, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity to create a larger and deeper network of understanding of um, species suitability and species range shifts. And my colleague, Camille stevens Ruman and I have um, started with the support of a lot of staff from the Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest, a study that's starting to look at something just like that. Um, and then I think additionally, in terms of management actions, just for example, when we're starting to really ramp up seed collection in the coming years, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really examine um, and do studies on the genetic diversity that's really appropriate for both large-scale reforestation and species conservation. So I'm sure I'm well over time. I want to echo Chris really quickly that I think all of us being here together is so inspiring and that um, together we can tackle a lot of these challenges. So I'd love to chat. More. Thank you. And I'm supposed to sit down. Thanks a lot, Maren. And I know we have some really rich discussions today, and it's so challenging. You're, you're fine. 
Um, our next speaker is Hannah Ertle, but honestly, I just looked at the email with your slides. And so I think Angela's gonna, I just forwarded it. So I'm wondering if we should do a quick switch because I don't have your slide. Oh. <gasps> this, so this team is amazing. So our next speaker is Hannah Ertle from Trees, Water, and People. Whew, glad that worked out. Um, so first, thank you all so much for having me and inviting me to speak today. Uh, the first thing I want to do is temper your expectations. This is a, a project, um, Tribal Lands Reforestation, that my organization has been very closely involved in for a number of years now, and I've only become peripherally involved in in the last handful of months. So we'll be doing a little bit of learning together. Um, and actually, many of you from the audience, or at least some of you I know, have been really closely involved in, in uh, the project that I'm going to talk about, so you probably know more about it than I do. So I'd like to first start with a land acknowledgement. Trees, Water, and People, our office here in Fort Collins, is um, it's located on the living homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that um, you know, it's, it's in these areas that Native people still depend on, they still utilize, they still come to, and they still recognize as their ancestral homeland. So that's something that I think is important to acknowledge and just take time to think about as we're standing here in Fort Collins. All right, so um, many of the, the talks that I've seen over the last few days, <clears throat> excuse me, two days, I just realized I didn't start my timer. Um, they've been really amazing. They're very science you're very technical or, or policy oriented, and this one is not that. This is more about building those collaborations and those interpersonal connections and how really uh, building that community can help create more sustainable conservation goals in the future. Um, so I wanna start by sharing our mission which is to improve people's lives by helping communities to protect, conserve, and manage their natural resources for which their well-being depends. So really it's this idea of community-based conservation and community involvement in, in these projects. And that's based on two core beliefs, that natural resources are best protected when local people play an active role in their care and management and that preserving the local ecosystem is essential for the social, cultural, economic, and environmental well-being of communities. Oh, goodness. <sighs> yes, risky. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. <laughs> So at TWP, we have um, two main programs. One is our Indigenous Lands Program. We also have a Central America program. I'm an ecologist in our Indigenous Lands Program, and, and we are an organization um, not of scientists. Actually, I'm the only ologist in the organization. So really, we are about building connections and uh, helping to facilitate projects and, and um, connect organizations that can support each other. So. Um, in the Indigenous Lands Program, really our philosophy is to engage tribes to kind of, a, a, one of the, the talks that I saw yesterday was really just not just consulting with tribes and saying, oh, I checked the box, I consulted with the tribe, but really helping um, uh, support their and, and promote their seat at the table and just making sure that tribes have the opportunity and have the resources that they need to be decision makers and to be involved in projects on, on tribal lands and also on ancestral lands. So uh, the indigenous planning process, there's the pro-indigenous, for indigenous people, with indigenous people, and also by indigenous people. And this is something that uh, we take into consideration as we are um, really as early as the strategic planning process, um, just in the, the beginning stages of these projects that we work on. So here's just kind of a case study. Um, James Calabaza, whom you all met yesterday, has been, again, he's, he's been our, our leader on this project in the Hamas Mountains. Um, and one thing that I want to mention is that we, we're working very closely with uh, many, um, some of the, the Southern Pueblos. And 
the information that we're sharing today, we have, you know, when you share information on tribal lands or about tribal lands, it's always good to just ask and, and share and, and make sure that um, you have that, um, the ability to do that. So this is something that we've worked closely with the forestry department and they know that we're sharing this today. So uh, historically there have been a number of high severities fires in the Hamas Mountains. Uh, three really large fires in 1996, the Dome Fire, the Cerro Grande in 2000, and the Las Conchas Fire in 2011. And you saw some of the results of that in, in Daniel's slides yesterday. Um, debris flows, flooding, loss of forested lands, just incredible amount of damage that happened in these areas. Um, and so really our goal was to reestablish the trees in mixed conifer zone in the Hamas Mountains that are, were impacted by the Los Conchas fire. Um, but notice that the second two goals are really more biocultural goals where we're increasing the, the tribal capacity to implement these projects themselves and also sustaining that connection between people and the landscape because many of these areas and, and specifically the species that we're talking about and the species that we're planting are important for cultural reasons. Um, so we focus mainly on really centering those tribal priorities. So the two species that I just mentioned or, or kind of touched on, Douglas fir and ponderosa pine, these are um, culturally important species. And so we sort of, as we're developing the areas um, where these are being planted, we're taking into account what is the ancestral history, where do people go to harvest. Um, so we have the, the science piece that I'll get to here in a moment. Let's see. So, you know, looking at the climate suitability and using these um, tools that have been developed by, I know Kyle Rodman was one of the scientists um, and the Swearies and, and USGS using these tools to identify best places for reforestation, but then also um, prioritizing those that have cultural value. And so um, we focused on three of the more suitable areas um, and prioritized those that had the cultural uh, more cultural value with the Pueblo, and we utilize this nucleation plot style. So the idea is this this very large amount of landscape burned, and we, we as Marin mentioned, we don't have the seeds to reforest all of it. We don't have the, the time and the money either. So, um, so we used a nucleation plot style, and the idea is that we are crying, trying to create these, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea of like nucleation plots or restoration islands where um, we, you're creating a seed source from a small, uh, a small plot. It's kind of the long game, right? You want your small plot to mature and then become a seed source to reseed other areas. Oh, sorry, this is so tricky. Okay. So the idea is that it'll mimic the natural regeneration um, and we have denser stands more widely spaced apart across the landscape. And I only have a few minutes left, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, we also did a lot of capacity building in, in training around monitoring for these nucleation plots and this is something that we're still working on because we are still working with the public to continue planting trees and to monitor those. So um, really, uh, we have six month and one year post planting intervals. Um, and we want to know, you know, our, is, is what we're doing working, basically. And so, goodness, I really apologize, guys. I'm not gonna go over, over all of these, um, but we've, we've had a lot of lessons learned. I think our initial strategy was to get out there and plant a large number of trees in these nucleation plots and to do a very, you know, those, those plots are very densely uh, planted. And the focus was really on, initially the focus was on getting 3,000 trees in the ground by the end of next month kind of thing. And what we're finding is um, survival in those highly planted areas is lower than anticipated. And so 
our future steps um, is really just ramping up our post-planting care, um, looking at sort of as, as Marin touched on, um, looking at seed source and whether we need to be considering like the elevational shift, um, collecting local seeds to provide to the nurseries. And I only have one minute left, so I'm going to... I'm going to skip forward really quickly. Um, I just want to acknowledge our restoration partners. Um, the Tri Pueblo Coalition, so the Jemez Pueblo, Santa Domingo Pueblo, or the Kiwa Pueblo, and also uh, Cochiti Pueblo have been really, um, really closely involved in this work. And I mean, these are the guys out there with the dibbles planting the trees. It was really great this fall. We actually had a um, some of our tri public coalition partners came out on lands that were not their own and working with um, DNRs that they usually, you know, have had historical con conflicts with um, to achieve this work together. So it was kind of a, it was uh, very hopeful to see that good neighbor policy happening. Um, also, the Nature Conservancy, the East Jemez Landscape Futures Collective, New Mexico State Forestry Division, and the De JTH Forestry Research Center in Mora. And we're going to skip this one. <laughs> oh, gosh, I did it again. I apologize. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hannah. And I'm just curious, is there, are there tips for this? Is it just really sensitive? It's very sensitive. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker is Thomas Timberlake. He's with the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. Good luck. Thanks for having me. Um, happy to be here to share some thoughts on climate change vulnerability assessments and sort of climate change adaptation more generally. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm with the Pacific Northwest Research Station Western Wildland Environmental Threat Assessment Center, or WETAC for short. Um, so I do some uh, sort of climate science assessment and adaptation work um, in support of uh, national forests across the western regions of the United States. I'm also the regional climate change coordinator for the Forest Service's uh, Region 6 or Pacific Northwest region. So that's the national forests in Oregon and Washington. So do some kind of sciencey work, but also kind of wear that dreaded mid-level regional office bureaucrat hat as well. So kind of speaking for both of those perspectives today. I should also mention too that um, I worked for a couple years in the Rocky Mountain Regional Office and before that uh, did a PhD at Colorado State University. So this is a nice trip down memory lane on a couple of, um, on a couple of dimensions. Uh, so real quick, climate change vulnerability assessments refer to uh, sort of science publications and processes uh, that address the potential impacts of climate change on resources in particular places. Uh, they're often developed through collaborative efforts between scientists and managers. And they also generally uh, go beyond just identifying the vulnerabilities um, associated with climate change and identify potential adaptation actions uh, that may be implemented to take on the risks associated with climate change. Really, though, I think what I'm going to share today isn't exclusively related to vulnerability assessments. It's applicable sort of to other forms of actionable science more broadly and just their thoughts about climate change adaptation that don't even really need to pertain to the science side of things. So wanted to just kind of highlight my main message here, which is that climate change adaptation is a continuous process. It's not just a kind of one-off, step-by-step thing. Not always linear either. It involves a series of decisions and actions happening at different levels of organizations, inside and outside of organizations, happening in different places. And really, the big changes that um, appear to be necessary to take on climate change those are going to come from the accumulation of a series of smaller actions and decisions, often happening, often happening locally, but also kind of in line with more national and regional efforts. I think this idea has come up already um, today. The concept of the reforestation pipeline, for example, I think recognizes the fact that implementing a climate-informed reforestation project on the ground isn't just about planting those trees um, at that particular moment. There's a whole lot of steps related to seed collection, growing seedlings, all that that goes into it. 
I think also some of the lessons yesterday about success stories also speak to this um, in terms of sort of seeing effective fuel treatments on the ground as well as getting more good fire on the ground. It wasn't just about the decisions in those moments. It was also a series of kind of actions and efforts that led into those decisions to sort of enabled that, uh, that work in those particular moments. So I think the idea here is to think about those kind of little actions that you can take today that set you up to take advantage of those big opportunities, of which there are many these days with the sort of all the funding going into the system. So I also wanted to just kind of highlight a few kind of sub points that I think speak to this broader um, to this broader message. First and foremost, I think if you're managing uh, landscapes or kind of interacting with public lands or forest management in the Western United States, you are already adapting to something right now. It may not be explicitly adapting to climate change. Um, in sort of the words climate change may not be sort of uh, intentional and explicit in Chris's words, um, but I think we do want to acknowledge the fact that we are adjusting, preparing, and responding to um, many trends that are sort of associated with what the science is saying is going to happen as a result of climate change. For example, we've seen big fire years, large areas burn, fires burning later into, um, into the fall, um, as well as I think the Marshall Fire example kind of gives credence to this idea, this kind of talking point about fire seasons becoming fire years. It's not just fire, as Chris mentioned. Um, hydrologic impacts of climate change, I think, are a big deal, something we're dealing with um, especially acutely in the Pacific Northwest. I think we also want to think about sort of watershed restoration or watershed adaptation as an important element um, of the work we're doing, not just about trees. Also, want to acknowledge the fact that uh, we've seen some recent kind of big heat waves and things that affect humans, um, people, communities in their day-to-day -day lives. So we are already kind of adjusting and adapting to these types of things. So let's think about the lessons learned um, through recent events, figure out what's relevant, figure out where we weren't prepared, make changes, and kind of build on that work. Uh, second point um, that I want to make is that, uh, and I think this fits in with this theme of storytelling, we need to do a better job, I think, of providing explanations of how some of the higher level sophisticated models, um, what they mean for specific places, as well as what the sort of high level policies, um, how those apply locally. What do what does shifting fire regimes, for example, mean in northern Colorado? Uh, let's articulate that. Let's put it into plain language while also acknowledging the sort of complexity and uncertainty of the topic at hand. So in the vulnerability assessments um, that we've worked on, I mean, we include some kind of complex effects modeling of changes, um, changes in hydrology as a result of climate change. And those produce some nice maps, and those get, maps get used. They get cited in uh, NEPA and other planning documents. Um, but I think where we're really going to be effective is when we can actually explain what those maps mean, what assumptions kind of go into the models, um, and what that actually, again, what that means for management. Uh, so the final point I think I want to make today um, is that I think we already often kind of jump to the what and where of climate change adaptation. I think when I kind of got involved in this and sort of when I start a vulnerability assessment process or otherwise I'm thinking about impacts of climate change, I often think about sort of what species or ecosystems are most vulnerable um, and also those places where on the landscape might be most, most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, but I've also realized in sort of having these workshop conversations um, with managers and others that it's also important to think about the sort of who, when, how, and why of climate change adaptation. Uh, staffing is an important aspect of climate change adaptation. We need people. We need trained people who know uh, what they're doing, know how to read the kind of signals on the landscape and implement adaptation actions. Um, so staffing decisions can be adaptation decisions. It's not always about the kind of technical implementation uh, work happening on the ground. Um, I think Hannah's presentation before this alluded to this. The win element is also important. It's about, uh, so climate change I think is affecting certain places, but it's also affecting the timing of things, um, both within years, seasonal timing of uh, when we're seeing runoff, for example, um, all, but also I think thinking about the fact we're going to be see more kind of variability from year to year in uh, climate and have those still have some big snow years but also have some really dry years. So how does that affect uh, sort of implementing work on the ground? Can we shift our pile burning to really take advantage of those big uh, snow years, for example? Um, and I think also Hannah spoke to this in terms of the day by day. When are we doing work on the ground? Getting trees in the ground earlier in the day when it's cooler out, that's an example, I think, of the win um, of climate adaptation. I'll end with why, too. I think um, there's lots of work kind of already happening on the ground that does 
um, sort of get us closer to having adapted uh, ecosystems and communities. Um, again, that work is not always happening sort of intentionally or explicitly as a result of climate change. The why may be something related to restoration of resilient ecosystems, which I think Chris alluded to, potentially being some double speak there. So I think there's also this task of just adding the why, sort of adapting to climate change as part of the sort of purpose and need to use NEPA speak um, of the work we're doing and to try and be more sort of intentional ex and explicit about that but also being specific to how that applies to particular landscapes. Um, and to end it, I don't have a formal acknowledgments slide here but just want to kind of note that a lot of these ideas I'm sharing today are kind of a reflection not just of my own work but work I've done um, as a student here at Colorado State University but also kind of working with uh, fellow Forest Service staff, scientists, and also our partners. So I want to kind of acknowledge you all. So happy to um, answer questions. I don't know how we're doing that, participate in the discuss discussion groups, but otherwise, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. And now I'd like to welcome up Anita Rose, who's our um, USDA Region 3 Climate Adaptation Specialist. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my talk. My name is Anita Rose, and I lead the AIR program and the climate change program in the southwestern region of the Forest Service. Now, if you don't know what I mean by southwestern region, no worries, I got you. Um, we also call it Region 3. I'll probably uh, uh, make that fallback uh, term many times. And really an extremely diverse region topographically, floristically, culturally. And um, we have uh, many different ecosystem types, a lot of fire adapted types, and 11 national forests and two national grasslands. Primarily, it's New Mexico and Arizona, but we do have a couple of uh, grasslands over in Oklahoma and Texas. Uh oh, oh my goodness. Okay. All right, so what I wanna share with you today is really this adaptation strategy that we've been developing for the Southwestern region. And it is built upon the adaptation workbook that um, the folks at NIACS developed, a show of hands, folks that are familiar with the adaptation workbook. Oh good, quite a few people. Uh, so, you know, I will say that there is going to be a session this afternoon, so if you're interested in the OG adaptation workbook, you might check that one out. Uh, so what we did in the southwestern region is we took that strategy and we sort of made it our own. We wanted to integrate existing tools, uh, science, uh, etc. And, you know, bottom line is that our practitioners need guidance on the ground. They need, they need a cookbook right, for what, what things to consider and um, how, how do you adapt to climate when you're, you know, doing uh, restoration, uh, climate-informed restoration. All right, so I want to highlight just a couple of things that are in our strategy. This is sort of my soft launch. This is, you guys are seeing this for the first time, and and uh, even my Region 3 peeps, shout out to you guys, are, are, this is new to you, I realize. Um, so I wanted to highlight just a couple of things. We did go through a six-step um, workbook process, you know, defining location and assessing vulnerabilities. And I'm not going to read all that. You can see the steps there. So one thing I really wanted to highlight here for you is the idea of an integrated landscape prioritization. One thing we wanted to avoid was creating something completely new and separate from everything else. Um, although we kind of tend to like to do that in the Forest Service, we felt like, hey, let's, let's challenge you know, our practitioners to think about what are the existing priorities and sidebars and guidelines and initiatives that are already out there? So think um, shared stewardship or environmental justice or um, watershed condition framework. You know, 
the list is quite long, so I, I think you get the picture. So when you, when you start to consider those things together in an integrated fashion, and then you bring in your vulnerability assessments, you start to get a clearer picture of where you might want to prioritize your actions, or maybe if you want to do things a little differently, et cetera. All right, so another key thing that we've really built into this strategy is um, the vulnerability assessments that we have for the southwestern region, and yikes, right? Okay, so most of the southwestern region is considered high or highly vulnerable to climate change, and um, this is the, the map I'm showing here is what we call our upland ecosystem vulnerability assessment, and that's based upon the expected departure of future climate, so 2100 from reference condition. So what does that look like when you actually zoom in on a project area? And hopefully this looks familiar if you checked out the, the posters uh, last night. There were at least two that were focused on Rio Chama, um, which is a CFLRP. And uh, of course, this is the sub-basin, so this is you know kind of a, a subset of that. And this is the upland ecosystem vulnerability assessment that I was showing you in the last slide. And you know you can start to see where are the areas of low vulnerability, where are the areas of high vulnerability. And so, uh, of course, there's also ownership on here. And then let's also take a look at what does our aquatic riparian vulnerability assessment look like. Here we focused on uh, metrics based upon you know expected changes in stream temperature and um, um, T and E species occurrence, and you know there's a there's a whole long list. So, you know it's kind of fun to I think, uh, you know oh my gosh, of course, go back and forth if I can figure this out, and you know think about well where where do we have overlapping um, uh, risks? And um, one thing that that um, we've talked a lot about is do we want to focus our actions in areas of low vulnerability, and that's a little bit counterintuitive, right? But that's where your successes are gonna happen. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're thinking through this, this is an iterative process, this is gonna, you know, change and evolve over time. The science is developing every day. Uh, so this is kind of our first attempt at, um, you know, having an adaptation strategy that our practitioners can take and kind of wrap their brain around what do they need to consider when they're, you know, uh, trying to be climate informed. And the last thing I want to mention here, which this is a very Forest Service centric idea, but um, we do have in the southwestern region um, a new set of revised forest plans, and those forest plans have something called desired conditions. And so we built that into our strategy because our forest plans really are at the heart of what we do on the landscape, so we don't want that to be a separate thing from the adaptation strategy. And um, the Forest Service has um, chosen to go with the resistance, resilience, transition typology or framework. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is just an example of what we're hoping our folks will think through when they're, you know, looking at desired conditions and what they're going to do on the landscape and, you know, make those, make those climate informed decisions. And I'm already retraining myself to not say climate smart. When Chris Swanson says don't say climate smart, then you, you know, you do climate informed. And um, with that, I just want to say I have, want to say thank you to a whole lot of collaborators and contributors and Courtney as well, apologies for leaving you off. And at the risk of, of maybe being a little controversial, I did want to say that Smokey Bear, the original live Smokey Bear is from my region, the Lincoln National Forest. And um, with that, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Anita. Our next speaker is Brian Miller from USGS and the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. Good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot, Amy. 
thanks everybody for sticking it out here through our session. Um, so the work that I was asked to share today is the culmination of about a decade um, of place-based adaptation work with the National Park Service. Um, and so as you can imagine, uh, that work has involved a whole lot of people, and I've just sort of listed some of the core folks here on this slide from, from Park Service, USGS, and an individual who's now a Fish and Wildlife. All right, so as we've been talking about, you know, of course, climate change, it's here. It's, it's now. Um, we're feeling its effects um, on the landscapes that we work in. Um, but when we look to the future of climate change, we're immediately confronted with a lot more uncertainty. Um, you know, here what I'm showing is just an example plot. I'm sure you've seen lots of things like this of mean annual temperature. This is downscaled for a particular place, Badlands National Park. Um, and of course, there's broad agreement. Temperatures will go up more, more extreme events, and so on. Um, but the details then um, are much uh, less clear. So we don't know exactly how much temperature might go up. Um, when we look at things like precipitation, uh, we can't always say if we're going to get more or less, let alone the magnitude of that change. So from a management standpoint, um, this can leave us feeling somewhat paralyzed, right? Um, in the sense that, hey, you know, well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. How can we possibly prepare for a future like that? Um, but I, I'm, I want to sort of promote one approach that we've been using with effect in the National Park Service, and that is uh, scenario planning. So I want to, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a bit of just a general sense of, of sort of what it is and then our flavor of doing it. So it stands quite in contrast to more traditional sort of forecast-based approaches depicted there on the left, where we assume that, you know, the future will resemble the past. We can predict it with a fair amount of certainty. And so we sort of plan around a single future that is sort of most likely. Um, scenario planning takes a very different approach, which is to say um, we take a bit more humility and say, well, there's a lot of ways that the future could, could um, play out. And so we're going to think open-mindedly about um, a multitude of of different potential futures that we may, may face and plan around those. Um, and before I sort of dive into our particular way of doing that work, I'll just say we didn't invent it. Scenario planning has been around for a long time. It's been used in a lot of different contexts. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm going to share here today is, is just our one, one flavor for doing what we call uh, participatory climate change scenario planning. So I want to step through. Um, uh, an example of from some of our work with Badlands National Park. Um, but in all of our instances of this work, we begin with the resources that a management unit, a particular place and set of people care about. What are their focal resources? What it is that they manage for on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, here's some images from Badlands. Um, just to familiarize you with the landscape if you haven't been there. Um, diversity of flora, fauna, cultural resources as well. Um, and we work with management partners to sort of boil this diversity down to a short list. So what are the things on this landscape that you're, you're, you're dealing with managing for every day? Um, and importantly, you know, this set of resources serves as the foundation for the rest of the process. Um, it looks like I, I lost a slide there, but essentially um, we use this then to say, okay, well, um, what are these resources sensitive to in terms of climate? So we don't just look at annual average temp and precip, but are there certain aspects of those climate features that are most relevant to, to the resources you manage for? And those, and sort of backing up since I missed this slide, um, are what we call critical uncertainties in step two there. And those uncertainties then inform uh, our look at, okay, well, if it is spring precip, um, let's say, you know, how much change could we expect to see in that particular variable going into the future? Um, and this is where it becomes a bit more technical, and so where we, we go to our desks and do this work. Um, and we've, we've sort of uh, moved away from just generic kind of, you know, uh, qualitative uh, senses of, okay, well, annual average temp might go up a lot or a little bit. Um, instead, we really dig into the climate model data. This is just an example scatter plot showing um, each of those points as a global climate model realization, showing changes in two different um, uh, climate metrics, on the, one on the x and one on the y-axis. The details here don't matter, except to illustrate that we then intentionally look across these sorts of scatter plots to identify maybe three or four uh, GCM realizations that, as best as possible, capture the range of uncertainties in those metrics that are most important to a particular resource management unit. So those three or four climate futures really capture the divergence of conditions uh, a particular place is expected to experience. 
And we then, we summarize those in ways that are much more accessible than those uh, sort of wonky scatter plots. Um, some of them are semi-quantitative, like these kind of arrow diagrams. Um, some, you know, sometimes we provide, um, you know, box plots or charts or tables or what have you. Lots of different ways to communicate this information to the folks that we'll be working with. Um, and, and that's really crucial to the, the sort of the heart of the process, which is the development of the scenarios themselves. Um, and we use scenarios in lots of different ways, I think, in just our day-to-day -day language. But here I'm talking about storylines. Storylines about how climate change might play out in a particular place. And we develop these, really, with the people who know the places best. Um, the subject matter experts, the management partners uh, there that work and know the landscape best. And, you know, we bring the climate information, but then we say, hey, you know, what would scenario one here mean for your bison, for your grasslands, uh, for your forests, how would that affect um, uh, the ecology of a given place? And sometimes we'll augment that with additional um, quantitative response modeling, whether it's hydrologic or ecological, um, but really the, the, the core of the process here is very participatory um, to get people to deeply sort of live in these scenarios and, and bring their knowledge to bear on the issue. Um, and importantly, we don't just stop the scenarios. The scenarios are great, but um, the scenarios are really powerful for testing management strategy. And, this, and that's what we really want to get to here, um, which is to say that we want for each of the scenarios to people to ask themselves, hey, you know, if the world turned out like we described in scenario one, two, three, or four, are you going to be successful? Um, are you going to be able to meet your current goals with your current activities? And, and if not, then this is the time to start to revise those. Um, sometimes it's revising just the activities, sometimes you got to go back to the drawing board and revise the goals as well. So to make this a little more tangible, I'll just quickly share, um, I'd like to quickly share you know, maybe two-ish um, sorts of examples of the ways this kind of work has influenced some of the management decisions on the ground um, at these uh, National Park Service units. Um, the upper left is an image from Devil's Tower National Monument. You can kind of see maybe in the background um, a couple of buildings there. Uh, you probably can't see there's additional infrastructure. And, and this is at a, um, a really important spring uh, within the park. And the, the park had been planning to remove that built those built structures to restore natural conditions um, there in this, at this spring. Um, but the scenario planning process really made people realize that that infrastructure could very much be an asset in terms of maintaining surface water availability for both flora and, and fauna there uh, at the park. So they uh, sort of did a 180. They've decided to leave it in place for now um, because of that. The lower right image uh, is of a, a stream that's central to Wind Cave National Park. Um, and the scenario planning process that we worked through with them really cemented the manager's resolve to um, maintain surface water there for their bison and elk populations because even under futures with um, sort of more precipitation, there's likely to be uh, drier conditions because of, because of increased evapotranspiration. So just to give you a flavor of some of the on the ground sorts of decisions people are making, um, those are a few examples, but importantly, we've, what the, maybe the most important thing, at least that I've learned through this work, is that standalone scenario planning, it's great, um, you know, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, but um, it's way more powerful and effective if we build it directly into existing planning processes. Um, and for the Park Service, those are resource stewardship strategies. These are sort of long-term uh, resource management planning processes that parks across the country are going through. And, and they result in these kind of like shiny um, summary documents like I'm showing you here, but also desktop applications that the park units use to make day-to-day -day, uh, decisions about budget and staffing and so on. So we're baking the climate change information directly into plans that they are already using. And we've also, we put out a supplemental guide sort of as a recipe for other people to follow who want to do more of this kind of climate change scenario planning work in the, in the Park Service. Um, back up one slide um, for a moment here, if it will, there we go. Um, just to say, I've, I've rushed through all this stuff um, really quickly. There's a lot more detail here uh, in these papers that we, we put out last year. Um, including some lessons about how um, how to do this kind of scenario planning stuff. I'm also more than happy to, to, to chat with folks about it, so uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, via email or phone. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks a lot, Brian. We have one more um, short lightning talk to share. It's uh, Lauren Creamer with the USDA Southwest Climate Hubs, and then she will be virtual, and then Courtney Peterson's in the audience um, running support. And also, as Anita mentioned, there'll be a, a session in the afternoon that Courtney will kind of walk people through. So I think if we're queued up to have Lauren join us virtually. I'm here. I'm here. Can everyone You're see here. my screen? And then we've got your slides. You look great. Hi, Lauren. Perfect. Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, let me see here. Um, hi. So, yeah, I'm Lauren Kramer, and um, I work with the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. Um, and today I'm just going to share some of the work that we're doing at the Hub in implementing actionable climate adaptation on the land in the Southwest. And this presentation was co-developed with my colleague, Courtney Peterson, um, with the Southwest and Northern Forest Climate Hubs, as well as NIACS. Um, and you all are lucky to have her in the room there today. So if you get a chance, say hi to her. She's awesome. Um, so the Climate Hubs are a really unique collaboration across the department's agencies. We have 10 regional hubs across the country, five of which are led by Agricultural Research Service Directors, and the other five are led by Forest Service Directors. And so the hubs really translate region-specific climate science into action by bridging science and management and helping to bring USDA research and resources into practices on the ground. And so we really work in these three main work streams, um, science and data synthesis, uh, technology, tool development and support, as well as outreach, convening and training. And for today's purposes, I'm gonna really focus on the technology and tool development and support branch and share some examples of how we're supporting climate informed planning and decision making in the Southwest. And so the first research that I want to, uh, the first resource I want to share with you today is something that I've personally been working on. Um, I've been working on developing an online tool shed of forest management resources in New Mexico and Arizona specifically. And this is called the Forest Resource Index for Decisions in Adaptation or FRIDA. And so in conversations that we've had with managers, it seems to be that there are countless tools and resources available for forest management, um, but it can be really overwhelming and difficult to know where to start. And there's really a need for accessible and applicable region specific information. And that's really, I think, what is most helpful in the work that we do. Um, so FRIDA will hopefully serve as a one-stop shop for forest management resources in the Southwest. And we'll actually be hosting some listening sessions early next year to launch this, um, one in New Mexico in collaboration with New Mexico State Forestry, and then another in Arizona in collaboration with Amy and ERI um, to get feedback and input from managers. So if this is something you're interested in participating, I'd love to have you there, so please let me know. And then another thing I wanted to share, um, our co-lead at the Hub, Bryce Richardson, who's with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, um, is working towards updating the seed, locks, the seed lot selection tool with some new research um, using FIA and BLM geospatial databases. Um, so to really understand kind of what forest composition might look like in the future and how we can better plan for reforestation in a changing climate. So um, I'm not gonna go too much into this just because of time, but if you see here on this map, um, this target area and that yellow diamond is near Blanca Peak at about 3000 meters. Um, and all of these dots are available climate analogs, um, ranging from strong analogs, which are that red color to more weak analogs, which are the blue. And so it's basically, and then this table is also showing that um, for elevations over 3,000 meters, there are about 10 plots with this composition that you see on this table. And as you can see over time um, with these strong analogs of these species in red, um, that the future vegetation is really going to be shifting from the subalpine to more of a Pinus ponderosa montane forest um, with significant representation of species from more of the pinyon juniper woodlands by mid-century. So this is really exciting research. I definitely keep an eye on this and see what Bryce is up to. Um, something else I wanted to share with is the after-fire toolkit for the Southwest. So this has been a really 
um, big collaboration we've been a part of. And basically, it's just an online toolkit for resources and tools, um, funding opportunities and publications to help managers and landowners and communities plan for and manage for post-fire flooding and erosion. Um, so you can check that out at that link below. And then finally, the resource, the last resource I wanted to share with you today is the Climate Adaptation Workbook and Adaptation Resources. So NIACS, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, has developed adaptation resources to help managers really integrate climate considerations into their management decisions. And we got to hear from Chris this morning, who was really instrumental in developing these resources. And so the adaptation, it sounds like from what Anita um, said, I couldn't see your hands, but it sounds like a lot of you know about what this is, but generally the adaptation workbook is a flexible five-step process that accommodates diverse land ownership and goals. Um, it's most typically used at the project level and really centers around the manager's own expertise and judgment. And it helps managers clarify and articulate how they're intentionally considering climate into their management plans. Um, and as a rule, um, the adaptation workbook does not make recommendations, um, but instead it creates this platform for managers to take credit for the good work they're already doing um, and create an opportunity for managers to recognize new approaches in dealing with climate related threats and vulnerabilities to their specific project locations. And along with the adaptation workbook, NIAX has also developed adaptation menus. And so these are a collection of possible adaptation actions that allow the user to decide what is most relevant for their location and connect their goals and intent um, on the landscape. And if you're interested in looking at this, um, you can look at that GTR at the bottom as well as adaptationworkbook.org for the online version of the workbook. And also this has been linked many times today or plugged, but um, if you wanna learn more about this process, Courtney is leading an interactive breakout session later today on the adaptation workbook. And so what we've done in the Southwest is we've been building a team of adaptation specialists to help share the adaptation workbook in the Southwest. And so we have piloted the adaptation workbook in Hawaii and the Rio Grande Basin in New Mexico um, by facilitating eight week online courses there. We've also partnered with the Rio Grande National Forest for a two day workshop in helping them with their forest plan using the adaptation workbook. Um, we're also working on constantly adapting the process to new audiences and really focusing on co-production to make sure that the user is involved in this process. So some examples of that, um, the South, there's a Southwest Tribal Climate Adaptation Menu that's in the works that's led by the New Mexico Tribal Resilience Action Network. Um, we're also tailoring the adaptation workbook process for NRCS, uh, our NRCS partners following some of the conversations, the climate conversations that we've had in 24 states so far. Um, and then really we're just continuing to learn from each other as we really continue to work in these diverse landscapes and audiences, especially in the Southwest. Um, and let's see, and then um, unfortunately, I can't share everything with you today. I wish I could. Um, but here's just a few resources that we have to offer. Please visit our website and um, learn what the Southwest Climate Hub can help for you, can help you, can help you in your work. Um, so with that, thank you so much. And um, please feel free to reach out to me or Courtney um, if you need to have any questions or follow up with the Southwest Climate Hub. Talks. Thank you guys for sticking it out, but I, I'm never sure what to expect, but this was so great because it was like, this is a complicated topic, but we heard about things and how they're being used on the ground with actual place-based examples of them. And I, so I really appreciate it. if we could get another round of hot. So we do have time for um, some questions and a little back and forth before break. And we've got some mic runners. Brett is over there. Is that Andrew over there? So um, we can open it up. I'd also encourage the panel, if you have questions for each other, that's fair. That's on. <laughs> so is there anybody who wants to kick us off? Amy, I can start with a question for Brian. Yeah. Um, so Brian, with the example that you brought up of And do, the, does he need to use oh, the mic? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
with the example of the spring structure, did you get a sense of if that was something that managers would have done across all of the scenarios you looked at, or is that something that was only going to be relevant for one or two of the scenarios? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, so in that case, um, it was really the result of a couple of scenarios that were particularly hot and dry um, and sort of planning for those more um, consequential scenarios for surface water availability and, um, and wildlife um, and plants that go along with it. Um, and so, yeah, in it, the sort of the, um, the nuance, I think, of the scenario the scenario based decision making that comes out through on during these processes is is um, you know risk tolerance what so in some cases it's easy like we're going to get the same result across all four of our scenarios that's sort of a no brainer we're going to make a decision that's robust across all of the scenarios but those more scenario dependent decisions where okay under this scenario it's going to get drier um, uh, but on this one, it's going to get you know wetter. That becomes um, more challenging and, and boils down to well, um, are you mandated to say manage for certain wildlife, or um, do you have more or less risk tolerance for certain outcomes? And so in that case, you know the the downside of leaving some of that infrastructure in place, um, I think outweighed um, or was outweighed by the. Um, or it, it outweighed the, the sort of the downside of, okay, we've got built structures there, but we can at least maintain surface water availability under a few of these potentially hotter, drier futures. Thanks. And we have Chris and Lauren. Yeah, this is Kyle Rodman from the ERI. Uh, Anita, a question for you. Other folks, feel free to chime in as well. So we have seen a lot of examples of tools and data sets, these nice visuals of quantifying vulnerability across the landscape or across the region. Uh, when you share that with managers, do you have a sense of how they're taking that information and applying it and are you know, using it on local scales? So that, that's a great question. And um, we're, we're really just getting this in the hands of managers just now. I mean, it's kind of been trickling through and, and um, we do have uh, climate change coordinators on all our forests that are helping to get the message out. The Rio Chama example that I showed you was a very recent example of someone who was working on a wild and scenic river um, um, management plan. That, that's not the exact name, but, and they wanted to take that into consideration and how, how they might um, incorporate climate adaptation into their new plan. Um, so it's, it's happening, it's, but it's happening very slowly. And um, one thing I will say is that some of that stuff is starting to make it into our NEPA analysis for, for projects, but you know, we've got a long way to go. Uh, Kyle, to be honest, I think we haven't done a whole lot in terms of quantitative comparisons of different places or different species in terms of their vulnerability. And I think, I mean, we can get into this. I'm not going to go down this road too much right now, but I think part of that too is I think what we've heard is a qualitative explanation of what could happen in this particular place, what's most likely that that can be just as effective and useful um, in a lot of contexts. So I think sometimes my approach or our approach has been to take what the models are saying and then try to explain why that particular outcome is being projected by the models. Um, so that would be something like, I mean, we have models of changes in increases in peak flow for streams. We present those models, they get, the maps get used, but I think sometimes it takes providing that explanation of, okay, this is driven by the fact that we're seeing warming, precipitation coming rather than as snow, it's coming as rain, you get rain in the winter, you get big kind of peak flows washing down the potential for flooding, and that's something I think that's happening relevant to our region. So I think sometimes it's translating things into words um, in that context. Certainly I think there's a desire given kind of a shift towards trying to use more spatial prioritization and stuff to incorporate climate change, but I think we also sometimes run into this issue about these model results are kind of uncertain or not necessarily relevant at the spatial scales um, that project level decision making is happening on. 
you know, if I can just jump in as well and, and build on both what Anita and, and Thomas said, um, I think it's really important for our decisions to be informed by a, a variety of tools, uh, but also critically for us to always remember those tools can't replace our judgment. Um, and what uh, Thomas just modeled was how you might take a couple of tools um, to inform uh, how you understand the system um, and then apply uh, that information to a decision or to a description of a possible outcome. And um, I think that's really the best possible use of tools where we understand that, you know, tools and models, uh, they're all flawed. Uh, they're all wrong uh, from some perspective or at some scale. Uh, and we just need to use them uh, where they're useful. Hi, I'm Christina Burry with Denver Water. Um, my question is, um, is from Marin's talk. So, um, Marin, you mentioned the U.S. Forest Service Forestry Assisted Migration Technical Assistance Teams, and that's the first time I've heard of that. And so I just wanted to get just a little bit more information about, about that opportunity and how you how we could engage with them, who's on it. Is it after a burned, is it like for burned area recovery or um, just more information about that team? Thanks. Okay, can you hear me? Um, Christina, you should talk to Mike Battaglia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, um, I, I don't know, um, you know a lot of those explicit details, but what I do understand is that the, ta the team was created um, within the last year and they're, they're planning to have within the next year or so um, some explicit deliverables in terms of a framework and some um, science advising and things like that. So, but I think Mike is probably the best person to talk to. I, I also, I get to ask a question. <laughs> so, one, if you've noticed, we're asking a lot of questions about, well, who's at, who's, who are you partnering with and, and who is missing at your table? And I, I think this could be for all of you, but Hannah, I kind of wanted to ask you with this on the ground project and you had this list of all the people that have helped with that, you know, what are the roles of all your partnerships and, and can you expand a little bit on how they made this reforestation effort happen? I would love to, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm based in, in Southwest Colorado. I, I work really closely with other tribes on other projects. I'm standing in for James today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, you know, one thing that I can say is I, I, I think that at the onset of this project, TWP was pretty instrumental in, in helping to develop the tri coalition and really just get that, that participation from, from neighbors, really. Um, it, it wasn't something, I mean, obviously, um, many of the actual tribal lands are geographically adjacent to each other and, and there's a lot of connection and family and, and culture. Um, but their DNRs weren't really working together across the landscape. And so I think that's where we kind of came in to help be the glue um, to, to encourage this collaboration to work in, in areas that are important to all of them. Um, and so I would, I would highlight, you know, We've worked with a lot of different partners, the state forestry, the, the nurseries, um, more nurseries that were even on that slide, and, and more. I know that we have more partnerships that were even on that slide, um, but really just starting with the, the tribes, starting with the Pueblos, and then going from there instead of the other way around. Um, I used to work for a tribe as their biologist, and one thing that I remember is it, there's this constant... Um, constant inflow of people who are, I need to consult with the tribe, I need to consult with the tribe, and it feels very much like they're checking a box, like I've consulted with the tribe, check. Um, and because there is that barrage of requests, it's very hard, especially because tribal departments are, are chronically underfunded um, and understaffed, it's, it's very hard to respond to all of those. So really developing authentic relationships where you're having conversations and they're, they're real and they're genuine and they're, you know, um, 
you're not just trying to fit your agenda and check the box on I consulted with the tribe, but you know, what is, what is the tribal priority? You know, you just kind of start there and then, and then develop the rest. So I don't know if I totally answered your question, but I hope I gave a, a good enough overview. <laughs> no, that was amazing. And I think I, what, I, what I really like is um, even all these people on the panel and all of you are, are the glue a lot of times, but we need these like nonprofit partners. We're, we, we talk about boundary spanning organ, organizations, and that would be trees, water, and people, but also our, our climate hubs and our climate adaptation science center, their boundary organizations getting science to different audiences. So yeah, I think you nailed my question. <laughs> um, I think we could do one more question if there's one from the audience. But, it, but if not, and we knew in anticipation, we actually moved our break availability up a little bit because we have a real focus of the networking, knowing this is the first back from COVID. So we wanted to make sure we, you get a long break. So we can break now and there should be snacks out there. And I just want to remind you, you're going from here to those breakout rooms, two in here, one in the poster, and then down the hall. All of them are the same. Try to separate from your friends. If you haven't met someone, follow them to a room. Don't make it weird. Let's not get stalkery. But you know, you can do that. And then after lunch will be our state forestry panel. So thank you guys and thanks again.